I'll present you with some different uh, diseases and different ways of uh, classifying or categorizing diseases. And I have to admit, it's not all in my mental health. It's mainly focused on water, sanitation, and hygiene issues. So that's kind of the mindset we are, we are going into now. Um, so there's almost <coughs> nothing about chemicals, for example, almost nothing about occupational risks and pollution. And but if you look at the classical water-related diseases, then they can be classified in these four groups here. What is a water-based disease? When humans are exposed to water, they are at risk of getting the disease. Uh, a water-related disease. So in this classification, uh, it's, it's, it's mainly about this vector, the, the, the the agent that transmits the disease, right, lives is dependent on the water as a breeding site. Yeah. So malaria and filariasis is mentioned here. A uh, water-washed <coughs> disease. These diseases that are mentioned here are controlled and prevented by actually washing. So mechanically, you wash away the uh, bacteria or the infection, and you actually prevent the disease from emerging again or uh, manifesting itself if you wash. So uh, uh, having bacteria on your hand is not a disease, but you can wash it off. But these are actually diseases that can disappear if you wash yourself. Yeah? We'll get back to it. Um, it's a little bit complex, and, that, and it's not so straightforward, and it's a little muddled, I have to, uh, 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 have to say. But you could also categorize some of the sanitation-related diseases with some categories here. Fecal oral, soil transmitted from helmets, water-based helmets, and excreta-related insect sectors. I have to I have to say they are not so straightforward, and some of them are overlapping with the water-related categories. So don't be too frustrated about this. Uh, but fecal oral are those. Uh, these are just examples. You could put more diseases out here. They are the diseases that are transmitted. Uh, to humans because uh, the bacteria move from fecal matter through the mouth. We ingest the bacteria and we get sick. So cholera and diarrheal diseases, right? Other diarrheal diseases. Soil transmitted helmets. Have you heard about that? Helmets are different kinds of worms and they are, or their eggs live in soils. Uh, and are transmitted to new persons from being exposed to the soil where these worm eggs or worms are in. And we'll take one as an example later. We'll take hookworm. Water-based helmets are also small worms, but they live in water. And the reason why it's sanitation related, we'll get back to that. It's a little bit complex. Uh, and then excreta related insect vectors, because uh, for example, filariasis is, uh, is also a it's a small mite, and it's, it breeds in latrines, so that's why it's sanitation related. Right, okay. So we'll take some diseases. The, the main point here is not that you become medical doctors that can explain all the stages <coughs> of the transmission cycle and so on. The point here is that you as environmental engineers can see this circle and understand how can we break the circle what interventions could we do in order to prevent and control this disease? So that's the main focus here. You can go home and read on WHO's homepage about all the medical uh, things about it, and I'm not going to explain that. Uh, but the point is for us here to identify where and how can we prevent some of these diseases. If you think about the circle like this, it's actually two circles, right? And we start up here where the human is infected. It's infected by a small uh, larvae that, uh, that is in the water. And when the human is in the water and has contact with the water, this small thing penetrates the skin. And uh, or you ingest it from the, from the mouth. When you swim, you uh, accidentally get a little bit into your mouth. And it migrates to your intestines where it uh, sucks blood. And at some point when it's mature, it goes to the liver, 
where it sits for some time and also uh, creates uh, small uh, infiltrations in the tissue. Uh, and then you have, they develop into worms, and curiously enough, I don't know why, they live in pairs. Uh, these, uh, these, um, these worms, they lay eggs, and they lay eggs in the, in the human tissue, in the, in the liver, or in the gallbladder, and in different other organs. And you see here, some of them can do, uh, migrate to the, either the A, the, the, the shed, uh, migrate to the intestines where they can be excreted as feces, or they can go to the gallbladder, uh, the bladder, here, bladder, and they can be excreted as urine. So it's a quite complex circle, I'm not going to go into it, but you ingest it when you swim, it develops in the body, and it's excreted in two ways, in urine or in feces. So here, in urine or in feces. Right. How does it get back to the water? It does that when people are urinating or defecating in water. These, uh, these uh, eggs, they need to go into the water in order to develop again. So it's only when uh, people uh, leave their, their urine or their uh, feces in water again, that it can, these eggs can hatch, they find a snail in the water that they infect, and then inside the snail they are able to develop again into some these small uh, larvae, spawn sites, that again are in the water and the human can again ingest it. Uh, the bad thing about this disease is not so much the, the worms in itself, but it's the, all the eggs that, are, that the worms lay in the human tissue they're kind of creating some small nodules or some small, some small knuder they will. And that, uh, that can disturb our organs. So if you look at a patient that has a lot of these uh, infections, you have these parts of the tissue that are damaged. You can get like a, a central nervous system <coughs> disrupting from that. And also your liver stops working and so on. If it's small children that are infected, they can also get anemia and pain and stomach pains and so on because they lose blood when these worms are sucking blood inside them. So now you are the engineers, clever engineers that have to stop schistosomiasis. Where are the points in this strange circle where we could intervene and do something? We have to stop that they get into water again, right? Yeah. yeah. Stop defecating in the water and stop urinating in the water. And if you if the guys in here think about it and you've been traveling, isn't it nice to stand at a lakeside and pee in the ocean or pee in the lake? Isn't it nice? It's only in freshwater bodies. So it's in, in rivers and lakes and puddles and dams and all So stop uh, urinating and stop defecating in the water. Are there other places to treat the water? You can filtrate it so uh, so this this little guy it's not in our drinking water anymore. You have to stop swimming in the water. Yeah. Why is that so different? It's an occupation, main occupation if you live near a big lake. For example, Lake Balawi or, or any of Lake Bosa in Ghana. It's a huge source of income for people who depend on the, on the fish and other animals. So that's really, really difficult, isn't it? And that's actually one of the main problems in the big control program. How can you tell fishermen not to touch the water. <laughs> I mean, it's almost impossible, right? But also, uh, children, stop, uh, prevent children from playing in water. It's very difficult. But it's some of the things you have to work with. Yeah? There are actually very creative programs around the world to do this. I met a PhD student from, um, from Atlanta who has built swimming pools in Africa for children to swim in. Very low cost, uh, very smart stuff, actually. But to prevent the children to go swimming in the lake every day because they were so sick from tristosomatis. Uh, so she created actually other recreational places for children to play in water. Clean water. If we think about the snail, there are actually some catastrophic examples uh, in the history where smart engineers uh, have built some smart stuff and they have actually increased the natural habitat of snails. Can you imagine why? And they have increased the diseases. For example, if you build a large dam or an irrigation 
suddenly there's more water for the snails to be in and more breeding sites. You suddenly have more systematic. So you have to be really technically smart to get rid of this. There are different ways, and I talked to a, a guy yesterday in our department, uh, what he would do. He said, well, you can do different things. You can flush the snails, or you can strand the snails. So you can actually uh, make some calculations on to provide speed on the water. So the snails cannot breathe. They need to be standing fairly still in the water. So to create some speed and so the water is flowing more. So that's, for example, if you're creating irrigation channels. I mean, channels that are only transportation ways for water. Then you can increase speed. You can maybe not have so many bends and so on. But of course, if it's a national water or natural water body, you can't increase speed. It's impossible, right? Uh, if you have dams or artificial water bodies, you can also level the water. You can, uh, you can vary the levels of water, so at some point you dry out some of the sites, and then you strand the snails so they, get, they dry out. So you can do different things, but as long as you make sure you don't increase the amount of snails and actually create schistosomiasis in your irrigation systems, right? Okay. That was schistosomiasis. We can go much more into detail, but I think you understand now the, the point of the transmission circle and putting in control measures at different points of the circle. So, so if you look at where it is uh, in the world, it's, uh, it's only in, almost only in, in Africa, and it's uh, in, in places around big lakes, and it's in places with a lot of natural water bodies. Um, and there are very, very big programs now to prevent schistosomiasis. Uh, in the last decade, millions and millions of people have, have been treated. <coughs> and what, what is now the most common way is that you do mass drug programs, mass drug administration. So you, uh, you give medication to people without diagnosis at first. You, you treat whole villages, especially if you know that they are in high-risk areas. So if they're living on the shore of a lake, and you know there's a load of uh, schistosomiasis in the lake, you treat the whole community. Uh, some places you go into school classes and estimate out of a school class how many children are infected, and if it's a high, a high rate, then you treat everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated program, and there's lots of uh, social and uh, anthropological and economic aspects of, of having a, a program like this. For example, Fishermen, they think uh, they get sick uh, from taking these pills, maybe you vomit or something, uh, and they're not sure that it's a good thing for them. And then they stay away simply the day that uh, the Ministry of Health is coming to give out drugs to, uh, to treat them. So, so there's lots of, of problems in having these mass drug programs for systems. There's, of course, a major control measure here as well that we didn't mention. Every engineer's favorite water supply. Right, water supply. We of course we would like to give people good water so they don't have to drink the infected water from the lake or the river, because for various reasons that kind of water might not be so good quality. So uh, providing uh, <coughs> drinking water from another source is also a very big part of schistosomiasis control program. So drilling wells or whatever you might figure out to do. I'm guessing you will get much more technical stuff, is that right, on the water supply later on. But that's, of course, a major thing. So you can filtrate the water, and if you're forced to use the lake water, you can filtrate it, but it would be better, of course, if you get your drinking water from another source. So hookworm, which is one of the helmets that we talk about, so soil, soil transmitted uh, infection. So what's the problem with helmets for humans? What's the issue here? Why do we get sick? <coughs> it's right that it reaches the intestines and it sucks blood. Maybe. Why is that not good? You can imagine a ch small child living in a poor rural area where the family doesn't have so much food. And, and then you have hundreds maybe or thousands maybe worms in your intestines. And it sucks blood. It's not so nice, is it? It's really disgusting, actually, all the when you see these squirts that can get up to 10 centimeters long. <laughs> it causes anemia, blood loss, right? In, especially in children and teenage girls. 
so you you lose blood, and uh, because they are in your intestines, you, you are not so good at absorbing mal uh, nutri nutrients, like you said, so you can get malnutrition. It actually can get so bad that for small children now it is evident that it causes uh, not only retarded growth, so you grow slower and you grow in a wrong way, but you can also get cognitively uh, disabled. So children who are, have heavy loads of these one infections, they are not making a, a good progress in school. They are not thinking fast enough. They get low grades uh, simply because they lack nutrients in their bodies. So it's really a disgusting thing, especially for children. So how does it work? So the eggs are shed in feces from all of us, uh, everybody who's infected, adults and children. So you shouldn't be able to get in contact with the human feces. And how do we prevent that? Sandals, shoes, that's control measure number one, right, for everybody. Uh, for, for those in touch with, in contact with, with animal and human feces, but also children. There are large programs in Africa that hand out shoes for children so they don't get into touch. But, I mean, if we are a little bit smarter than that, we could eliminate the eggs or the worms from being in the environment in the first place. How do we do that? Toilets. That's the answer. Latrines, right. That's the main control area for you as engineers. You have to build smart latrines that contain the human pieces in a safe way so nobody can get in contact with that. That's the main thing here, right? There's a quite a simple uh, clinical treatment for this, and I would actually recommend you that we, if, if, if ever you travel out, uh, buy some anti-helmets in the pharmacy before you leave for home, because it's so easily available in any pharmacy in Africa and Asia. You can buy it anywhere, and then you can treat yourself, uh, because in Denmark you have to go to the doctor to get a, um, a medication. And it's very, very likely that you're infected if you go traveling in Asia. Uh, these helmets eggs are everywhere in the food, in the soil, everywhere. You might touch something, so it's some, some countries like Vietnam, it's practically impossible not to get infected. Yeah. Okay, latrines is the main thing here. Okay, hookworm, if we look at where is it in the world, widespread, you can see that. Uh, widespread across Africa and Asia, uh, uh, part of Asia is mainly India, Bengal. I know you have a case for them. Oops. Um, and uh, there are very large programs for, for worm eradication, that is mainly mass drug uh, programs uh, for children, uh, so school based programs uh, where you. Uh, where you uh, give children drugs and then you take school tests after some time and see how many have been reinfected and you treat again. And then uh, on the side you have your more control and preventive missions. But large, large programs, lots of money is put into uh, these programs for children. Here uh, the graph shows the country requiring preventive chemotherapy so that it's an estimate of how many uh, children below 14 needs treatment still, so uh, this is a way to go. Okay, the next disease uh, will be relevant for your Tanzania cases, I'm guessing, but you have to investigate it more. Trachoma, it's one of the water-washed diseases. It's an infection, it's a bacterial infection with a, um, a chlamydia bacteria in the eyes. And what happens is that the, you, you get red eyes, like from any eye infection, and if it gets really bad, you get scarring of the eye. Because of the infection, it will scar the eye, and if it gets really, really bad, the eyelid can turn inwards, and then your eyelashes will, will irritate the eye so much. So, uh, and if it gets that severe, you have to be uh, operated, or you need surgery. Um, but before it gets really bad, you can actually do a lot just by washing your face <coughs> with water frequently. Uh, so you wash away the infection, the bacteria from the eyes. That's why it's washed here. Yeah. You can also, there's a major, um, major control program, and, and right now what most organizations is, is using is a program called SAFE. Uh, some places, places I've also seen it differently it's, it's spelled so it's called face, which is easy to remember because it's in the face. And it, it means a surgery, S for surgery, 
A for antibiotics, F for facial cleaning, and E for environmental control. And the last one, environmental control, it's that you guys, uh, what, are, what are we going to do about this disease? So educational programs where you teach people to wash a lot, uh, so teach them to, to improve their personal <coughs> hygiene, so facial cleaning, yeah. But to do that, you need to provide water, right? So water supply might be an issue here. Uh, it, it, this disease thrives in dry places where there's a lot of flies that can transmit the bacteria from human feces to humans. And in dry areas, you tend to not have so much water for personal hygiene. And if you don't have much water, you have to prioritize, right? So the water is mainly used probably for uh, preparing food. Uh, so you have to supply water and tell people to use more water on personal hygiene. The other control measures? Fly control. Fly con all kinds of fly <coughs> control. So locking up your food so flies doesn't get into it. Uh, controlling breeding sites for flies. So uh, waste management so you don't have waste lying around where that attracts a lot of flies. Uh, sanitation, right? So you don't have these flies sitting on the feces and then flying into the eyes of, of children. So it's a, it's a comprehensive program you need to put up here for trachoma. Uh, water supply, sanitation, education uh, is a big part here. Teaching people to get rid of this infection and, and uh, washing themselves. Uh, it's also, you also need to wash your clothes and your mattresses and your your thing, so it's a, it's a little bit of a disinfection. Uh, so it's increasing domestic hygiene in general that you need to t tell people. Uh, so it's, it can be a, a really complicated stuff. And you not, might also need to bring in surgery teams that can treat infected, uh, those who are really badly infected so they can get uh, antibiotics and surgery if you need. There's a lot of people like you see here that become blind uh, from untreated uh, trachoma because it's not a, it's an infection that you think it's not so bad, I can, I can manage, I'll just wash a little bit and then it gets gradually worse and worse and so there's actually a lot of blindness caused by trachoma. Uh, so this is where it is, there's some, a little bit of a strange, strange thing here, you see Australia is completely blue, uh, which is an endemic uh, area for blinding trachoma and uh, Brazil. Also India, and China, and large parts of it. Uh, Australia and Brazil, uh, it's mainly the indigenous populations. Uh, and in Australia, it's simply because it's very dry uh, and there's a lot of uh, flies. So you, uh, in those areas, there are big uh, phase or safe programs. Uh, and Brazil, it's the same. It's, uh, it's in the dry areas and it's a kind of hotspot areas where you have a lot of Guinea worm, this is the nastiest one of them all, I think. So the picture is just to explain to you. Uh, this is a worm coming out of the foot. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's really disgusting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but it's also really painful. And, and uh, there is no treatment for guinea worm. There's no good chemical treatment. So the treatment is simply to get rid of the worm when it comes out. Uh, and what they do, I saw this in Ghana, is that you have a, a stick and you roll the worm on the stick and attach it to your foot and then you drag the worm out slowly. Yeah, it's really nasty, I know. <laughs> Should I change the picture? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a nematode and, uh, and it's caused by drinking water that has this nematode or this uh, water flea, it's a small cyclone. Um, and it's, it's really painful to get it. Um, it's almost eradicated, that's the positive story. There's only three countries in the world that still have cases, and very few cases. Uh, uh, and one of them, uh, the ma majority of cases is in South Sudan, a uh, newly independent South Sudan. Uh, there must be a natural breeding site, I don't know why. <laughs> but, um, yeah. um, but there's a, a big uh, concern now that uh, because of the Ebola outbreak, that, uh, that these uh, these uh, last spots where you are actually really controlling these cases, uh, these uh, infections or the cases and people, that it might be bigger again because there's not a, a very because 
attention is, all attention in the health sectors are being diverted to other places. So you might see a growth in, in guinea worm again, uh, which is very sad. Yeah. Uh, based on these things, uh, prevention measures should be clear. Clean drinking water. This cyclops is so big, so you can also you can find filtrate it out of the water. It's actually a, a small flea that you can see with the human eye, so you can you can filtrate it out of the water. Even if you have the smallest number of your of, of suspicion in your in your cases, it should be enough to set up some water supply to avoid the uh, because it's uh, it's one of the first. Um, uh, parasitic diseases to be, uh, on the, I mean, it's on the verge of being eradicated in the whole world. So there's so much attention and so much energy put into these eradication programs that if we get rid of the last cases in these three countries, it's it's gone from the world from that point. It's it's uh, it migrates in the lymph system in, in humans. It's also why it's, it's so painful. Yeah. And then it it goes into your blood vessels and then it comes out of the skin when it when it needs to come out. Uh, so you see here are the last uh, uh, countries, uh, Sudan, uh, Chad, Nigeria, uh, Mali is on here, but I think it has been declared free now. And uh, Ghana was still here. I think it has also been declared free. And I know India and Pakistan have recently been declared uh, uh, guinea worm free.